Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shira Uriarte, and I'm the program manager for member education at the Jewish Funders Network. Thank you so much for joining this webinar entitled, Will Congress Kill the Charitable Deduction? U.S. Tax Policy and Philanthropy with Hadar Suskin. Before we begin the webinar, just a few housekeeping details I wanted to share. Um, just so you all know, everyone has joined the webinar in listen-only mode. If you have questions throughout the presentation and are joining us on the web, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box that you see on the screen in front of you. In just a minute, I'm going to set the call to record so that we can post it on our website for you to access at any time. So a little bit about JFN before we begin the program today. So JFN works with Jewish funders at the individual and collective levels to improve the quality of their giving and maximize their impact as they make the change they want to see in the world. JFN leverages the power and the creativity of networks to strengthen Jewish philanthropy around the world. And our year-round programming aims to keep members up to speed on the latest and most pressing topics in philanthropy in the Jewish community, locally and globally. We aim to help members build their philanthropic toolkits and explore relevant and important issues. In this webinar, our speaker, Hadar Suskin, will lead a discussion on U.S. tax policy and philanthropy. A little bit about our wonderful speaker today. Um, Hadar is the Senior Vice President of Government Relations at the Council on Foundations. He has nearly two decades of experience in public policy, philanthropy, and social movements. Hadar has been widely acknowledged as one of the leading advocacy voices working in Washington, D.C. on both domestic and foreign policy. He has built strong relationships with members of Congress, administration officials, and partners and allies from across the spectrum of American political life. And I'd like to welcome everybody again and turn it over to Hadar to begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Shira, and uh, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, I, I appreciated the introduction about JFN um, in part because I think that that mission is so important to help support people in their philanthropy, help maximize their impact, and the part about um, the programming you do trying to educate people on the most uh, pressing issues of the day. And I think tax policy is without a doubt, um, until this day at least, one of the most pressing issues. So I am very happy to be with all of you. Uh, I'm going to walk us through the PowerPoint that we've got, and um, I'm happy, we'll definitely have time for questions at the end, but also if there are pieces that come up along the way. Shira, do you want people to type questions into the question box? Is that the best way Yeah, to that's that? perfect. That's perfect. Everyone should have a Q&A box in their dashboard um, on their screen, and you can just type the questions right in there, and I'm happy to read them aloud to Hadar, and he can, and he can answer throughout the presentation so we don't have to wait till the end. Great, excellent, I am happy to do that. So, um, as you can see, we're here to talk about uh, the state of tax reform. Uh, before we start going on the slides, I'll just give a little bit of background that, you know, tax policy is, is a, living, a living creature. Every year it gets tweaked, added, subtracted, amended a little bit. Um, but we really are in a unique moment right now, what's really a generational moment. The last time we had comprehensive tax reform, where really Congress and the administration took the entirety of our tax code and put it on the table and said, okay, let's go through this, what's working, what's not working, what do we want to add, what do we want to subtract? The last time that really happened was 1986, and President Reagan signed that bill. So it's been more than 30 years since we've been in a moment like that. And as far as this Congress is concerned, it's really been almost two years in the making already. Um, I've been here at the Council on Foundations as Senior Vice President for Government Relations for almost two years, and I was hired because the council recognized that this moment was coming, that comprehensive tax reform was, was on the table. Um, many of the smaller distinct provisions that we worked on, and we'll, we'll get into those details, were, were uh, being held because what we were hearing from Congress was, yes, we're about to have comprehensive reform. Yes, we're about to have comprehensive reform. So um, now we're there. So let's jump into that. Sure, if we can go to the next slide. So there's me. We can go to, we can keep going. Uh, just a little bit about the council before we uh, jump into the tax policy content. 
Council has been around as a national leadership organization for philanthropy since 1949, represent members all through all 50 states and internationally. They range from um, private and family foundations, community foundations, corporate foundations, um, nearly a thousand foundations around the country and the world uh, engage deeply in their work with the council. And you can see we put forward our value proposition is, is framed in the context of amplifying, advocating, and strengthening for philanthropy. Go ahead, Chair. Uh, that's our team. Um, it, for those of you who might work with the council or might might be interested in doing so in the future, uh, you'll get a chance perhaps to interact with the rest of our government relations and public policy team. Okay, right, next. So this is the question we're really here to talk about today. What's up with tax reform? Next. When we think about tax reform, one of the first things we have to talk about is who are making these decisions? Who is dealing with these questions? So the tax reform is really driven by two key committees and like all uh, revenue generating pieces of legislation or policy, starts in the House and starts with the House Ways and Means Committee. House is of course controlled now by the Republican Party. So you'll see this is the membership list here. You can uh, perhaps those of you on the call can can, peek, can uh, pick out your own members who might be on the list. It's, um, it's sorry, pardon me, someone's knocking on my door. Uh, um, it's, it's led right now by Chairman Kevin Brady. You can see Richie Neal from Massachusetts is the ranking member. Next. On the Senate side, it's the Senate Finance Committee, led by Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah and Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon. Uh, it's these two bodies and the members of it who are the ones hosting the, who are the ones having the hearings, driving the legislation, and who are really ultimately going to be the ones who craft, put forward, and vote on uh, comprehensive tax reform, which will then, of course, go to the whole Congress. Next slide. So. If you take a look at this timeline, you can see it takes us from January of 2017 up until just about now. As you can see, this was House Speaker Paul Ryan's desired timeline. What they had announced last year is that they would be introducing a bill in February, having a markup by March, passing that bill out of the committee in May, having that bill go to the House floor for a full debate, passing that bill out of the, out of the House, sending it over to the Senate, see it marked up, which is that first committee consideration by the Senate in May, pass it out of that committee still there, go to the Senate floor for debate, consideration, and ultimately a vote by the end of June or early July. Then if the bills are not identical, you take the House bill and the Senate bill and you send them to conference where you'd have a few members from each body come together, agree on finalizing the details, and send that to President Trump for his signature, which was anticipated to happen in August. Go to next slide. So what went wrong? We've got the circle in June there, but really you could have that circle in a lot of different places. Um, needless to say, that didn't happen. A bill hasn't been signed. And in fact, you can go all the way back to the beginning of this list. A bill has not even been introduced in the House Ways and Means Committee for markup. So this whole schedule, which was very carefully and publicly laid out by Speaker Ryan, um, is at a bare minimum eight to nine months behind. Next slide, please, share. Thank you. So what went wrong there? What were the factors? First of all, I'm sure all of you recall the um, very considerable debate that we had around health care repeal and replace. This is particularly relevant to tax reform for a few reasons. First of all, the financial aspects, um, ha having not succeeded in repealing and replacing health care, it creates a different tax baseline. Part of their goal in in pushing the legislation that they did and that they were hoping to, to repeal the Affordable Care Act was it would have um, removed a number of taxes that would have made simply doing the math on tax reform easier for what the Republican majority is trying to achieve. Secondly, obviously, that took up a lot of time. It took up many, many days of the legislative calendar. It took up a lot of the energy and the political capital in the House. So simply the delay in passing the bill it's one of the reasons that we're now sitting here in September with no bill having been introduced yet. And finally, the disagreement, um, particularly in the Senate, because if you recall, they did pass a repeal and replace bill through the House, but the disagreement is in the Senate. And at the moment, I'm talking about the disagreement just among the Republican majority. That demonstrated that they really didn't have the political will and the political capital to be able to move forward. So that the 
healthcare debate was one of the major factors delaying tax reform. Next slide, please. Secondly, if we look at the challenges coming from the administration side, um, there have been very significant delays in the nomination um, and, and confirmation of key positions, including the Treasury, the Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy, and others. And it's worth really pointing out that um, mo most of the challenge, most of the problem there has really been delays in nominations, not in confirmation. Um, to the extent that people have been nominated to these key positions and appointed, most of them have gone through and been confirmed. So it's not a question of whether the Senate or anybody in the Senate is holding this up. It's really whether or not these people have even been appointed. Um, and then filling key White House positions that don't require um, Senate confirmation. So there have been, if, if you look at how this work was done, tax policy in the last administration, the one before that, the one before that, there are a number of key players who should have and would have been around the table who, where those roles are not even filled in this administration. So that's been part of the delay process as well. Next. And then really key is the competing views from the, from the key stakeholders. So we've got um, Speaker Ryan and Chairman Brady, Kevin Brady, who leads the House Ways and Means Committee. You know, they have prepared already two years ago a blueprint for tax reform, very detailed. They know exactly what they want to do. Um, you then have a different set of disagreeing and competing, largely competing views from the White House, and that's both Secretary Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, as well as Gary Cohen, the National Economic Advisor. Frankly, they really have disagreed even among themselves, but certainly they've had different views. And one of the key elements there has been the question about the border adjustability tax, which Without getting into the details of that, what's important to know about it is that was really the big economic driver in the Ryan Brady House plan, and that's what would have um, created the funding for much of tax reform, many of the other cuts and things they wanted to do. Uh, but the White House and others disagreed with that, so they have now removed that from the plan. You've got a different set of opinions among the Freedom Caucus, which is 35 to 40 or so of the most conservative House members who um, disagree with a lot of what's in both the Ryan, Ryan Brady plan and some of the White House opinions. You've got Senate Republicans who've got, frankly, a different competing set of views and priorities. And all that is, of course, just within the Republican caucus before you then get to congressional Democrats who pretty fundamentally disagree with what the White House and Republican House and Senate leadership is trying to do. Next slide. So where does that leave us now? Next. Competing legislative priorities. Healthcare in the Senate. The Senate uh, parliamentarian ruled that the provision that would allow the Senate to pass a healthcare repeal and reform bill um, with only 50 votes is going to expire the end of September. So we are most likely at a point where the healthcare debate in terms of repeal and replace is done, but it's still out there. Um, increasing the debt limit. So we had one vote uh, just last week where we did see a temporary increase of the debt limit. Um, but that is, was, was bumped supposedly until December, although today Senate Majority Leader McConnell said that he in fact thinks that will go, he, he's going to make it work so that that goes early into the next year. But it means that there will be another vote on increasing the debt limit um, within the next few months. And then, of course, spending legislation, um, passing a budget, which, you know, first of all, is a, a core function of the government and something essential that they need to do. But beyond that, passing the 2018 budget is also going to create that reconciliation vehicle, the, the tool that they uh, can use in order to only need 50 votes to pass or 51 to pass the tax reform in the Senate. So they can't get to tax reform until they've dealt with the spending legislation and the budget. And all of those things, as well as things like FAA reauthorization, S-CHIP reauthorization, the Children's Health Care, um, and, and a number of other really must-pass pieces of legislation are, are lining up, um, frankly, ahead of tax reform on the schedule. Next. So, whoop, back please. So we can see there 2017, whoop, and we somehow missed our cute little graphic, but that, that's our bill there in 2017, and we see it sliding right down the slide into 2018 because it looks like that is re really where we are headed with comprehensive tax reform, is that 
this uh, process will continue throughout this year, but we are very unlikely to see it come to fruition or come to a vote until next year. Next slide. So we're going to dig into um, into the details and the priorities a little bit. So um, our, our graphic is a little messed up there. At least that, there we go. So the council's priorities for tax reform include first and foremost, preserving the full scope and value of the charitable deduction. Um, all of you, you know, as I'm sure everybody who's involved in philanthropy knows, you know, the charitable deduction is really at, at, at the heart and soul. It is the vehicle that enables the work that all of us do in the way that we do it. And, you know, when we look at comprehensive tax reform, that means that everything up to and including the literal existence of the charitable deduction really is on the table. And, you know, my team and I spend our time talking to members of Congress and, uh, and their staff, and there have been, um, there have been a lot of questions saying, you know, do we need this? Is this why people give? What would the changes be if we eliminated it? What if we changed it? What if we put a cap on charitable deductions or a floor on charitable deductions? Um, so preserving that full value is really our first and prime priority. Um, it's worth noting that the good news is there are no actual provisions that have been introduced, nor do I expect any provisions that would eliminate the charitable deduction. Everybody, both parties, leadership, the White House have said they want to support and maintain the deduction, which is very good news. That's not true for many provisions in the tax code. Um, the challenge is that there are a number of things that they also want to include that would uh, lessen the scope and lessen the value of the deduction. And I'll get into those details in a bit. Um, some other priorities that if we look at the pure economic impact are smaller, but we know are very key to a lot of our members and a lot of donors include expanding, expanding the IRA charitable rollover to donor advised funds. This is something that's a key priority for anybody who does their giving through a DAF and frankly for organizations that run donor advised funds, which include Jewish federations, community foundations, and many, many others. Um, a really key provision is about simplifying the private foundation excise tax to a flat 1%. Uh, depending how, what people are interested in, we can get into the sort of the policy details there. But what that would do is basically make life easier for staff and, and trustees at community foundations, at, pardon me, at private foundations. Um, in calculating their taxes, and it would eliminate a situation that we have right now where there's actually a disincentive for private foundations to make um, unscheduled gifts. So at moments like now when we're dealing with hurricanes, when we're dealing with other disasters, and people often thankfully want to step up and make an increased gift, gift or an unscheduled gift, there actually in the current system are some tax penalties for that, and we've been working hard to eliminate that. Um, another provision that I do want to spend a little time on um, it's called the Johnson Amendment, and we've been working very hard to preserve the, the integrity and the independence of the sector. For those of you who might not be familiar with the Johnson Amendment, uh, we'll get into the details in, in just a moment. And then lastly, and of course really importantly, is just um, protecting the, the, the value and explaining the value of, of endowment, which, um, you know, for those of us in philanthropy, I think, you know, endowments are, are often the holy grail. That's, that's we understand that to be so core to our work, um, but I will tell you that for a lot of people on Capitol Hill, they look at those as very large bank accounts. So let's go to the next slide. So to start with the charitable deduction, again, I mentioned the scope and the value. There are two provisions that are in that Brady-Ryan House plan. They are in the plan that the White House has put out. They are in the plan Senate Republicans have put out. Basically, they're in any plan that's likely to move forward. One of those would double the current standard deduction, which what that means, and the reason they're doing it is to have far few people itemizing on their taxes. Um, they are looking at that as a simplification program that will, that will help make it easier for people to do their taxes. Um, the challenge for those of us in the philanthropic and charitable world is that, of course, when people itemize is where they take that charitable deduction. So we're going to go, if that were to happen, we'd go from a scenario where approximately 33 million people annually itemize on their taxes down to only about 5 million people, which means we would lose, a, which means a huge percentage of people who currently take the charitable deduction in their taxes would lose that ability and lose that incentive. 
Secondly, they also intend to decrease the top marginal tax rate, which of course your deduction is connected to your tax rate. So that again, draws some of the value. Um, if both of these happened in tax, in tax reform without changing other things, as you can see on the slide, that would be was a recent Indiana University study that that would be a decrease in $13.1 billion in charitable giving over a single year. So that's a huge, huge amount of charitable giving. And again, those policies aren't being enacted in order to do that. No one is going out of their way to decrease charitable giving. It is really an unintended consequence, uh, but it is a very, very significant one. And of course, repealing the estate tax, which is also really core Republican tax policy, would exacerbate that even further. The, the study didn't include that, but separate studies have um, concluded that that might contribute to a loss of as much as $20 billion annually. Next slide, please. So we use that $13.1 billion. So just to put a little bit of frame around what that means. Right, that's 144 billion meals for people facing hunger, 131 million days of childcare. Or if you look at the bottom, and you can see this slide was put together, um, you know, we can, I'm sure, equally do it with, with Jewish organizations, although it would be hard to get to that big a number. But that's the total combined charitable contributions for United Away, Feeding America, Catholic Charities, Salvation Army, all the rest there. And I can tell you, when we go to congressional offices and we say to them, Imagine your district with no YMCA, no Salvation Army, none of the Catholic Charities groups, no Boys and Girls Clubs, no Habitat, none of all the rest of this. Um, I think that really helps policymakers have an understanding of the really, really uh, immense scope of what this unintended consequence could do. Next, please. So we do, the good news is we have a plan to make this better. And the plan entails enacting what we call a universal charitable deduction. So this slide that you see up here, it was taken actually from Speaker Ryan and Chairman Brady. What they said is that they want to simplify the tax code so much that you could do your taxes on a postcard, which would be lovely. So this is what their postcard looks like. You can see you got your deductions up top and then you have taxable income, right? And then you subtract other things. Next slide, please. What we are suggesting is the AGI, the gross adjusted income, is moving it in such a way that basically all donors, all people who are giving charitable gifts um, can take that credit regardless of whether or not they're itemizing. So we're extending, we're extending the ability to use the charitable deduction to every donor regardless of the amount that they're giving, regardless of the level that they're giving. Next slide. Right? And you can see this, this is just showing the mechanics of that a little bit. The basic idea there is that you would take that deduction, again, regardless of what level you're giving at, you would take that deduction before you um, calculate your adjusted gross income that your taxes are then based on. Next. So not only would that recoup, in enacting that policy along with those others, not only would that recoup that 13.1 billion that would be lost, would actually generate an additional $4.8 billion in charitable giving. And it's really important to note that that money comes not because we expect Bill Gates to give another billion dollars or Warren Buffett to give $500 million or whatever it may be, because all of those people, and frankly, anybody who's giving right in the six figures, much less the seven figures, and really people who are giving in the five figures are already going to be itemizing. Those are the people that are going to continue to itemize anyway. This is actually about offering that charitable incentive to smaller dollar donors. And so when we work with partners in this area, you know, one of the groups that's most interested in that is the United Way. Because the United Way, while I'm sure they've got some, you know, some big million, million plus dollar donors, their average annual donation is $313, right? So for people who are giving on those smaller levels, $100 here, $500 there, um, it means that they would continue to be able to benefit from the charitable deduction if they currently can, or there would be also a whole class of people who even currently don't, ben don't benefit from the charitable deduction because they don't itemize, but they could go ahead and get that deduction for maybe you know, the $100 that they give every year or whatever that may be. Next, please. So these are just a few examples of some of the work that we've done here at the council. This is actually a congressional resolution 
that we had in, introduced earlier this year by uh, Congressman John Lewis and Congressman Jim Tiberi that, uh, that recognized the 100th anniversary of the creation of the charitable deduction. Um, and it's really just the kind of tool that we use to help build support for uh, the policies that we are that we're fighting for and the work that our whole sector does. Next. So to get to the donor advised fund piece, as I mentioned, currently, if somebody would like to make a gift from their IRA rollover into a, directly to a charity, they can do that. Um, but there is, as I'm sure those of you who, who work with donor advised funds know, um, there is a carve out that says you can't take that money and put it into a donor advised fund. Um, we've worked for a number of years now to get legislation introduced that would change that. And there is a House bill, as you see here, H.R. 4907. There's a Senate bill, S2750, um, that, would allow, that would get rid of that carve out and that would allow people to put that money directly into donor advised funds, which again, um, is a priority for both individuals that, that do their giving through funds, but also groups like Jewish federations, community foundations, and others that run those funds. And you know, donor advised funds are really an important tool they're just one tool that's out there. Um, it's, for us, it's a priority because we don't want to see um, limitations put on that. And this isn't a revenue issue. This doesn't impact uh, how much money goes into the government or, you know, or, or not. It's really just a question of letting people be as flexible as possible um, with their giving. So that's something that we've been working on. Next. So mentioned here the private foundation excise tax. This is the House bill. Uh, H.R. 2386. Again, this provision is also included in a Senate bill that we worked to introduce um, called the Charity Act. The Charity Act, you know, it would, as I said, it would simplify it so that uh, private foundations no longer have to spend the time and the resources looking to see if they're hitting exactly their averages or worrying about going over their average, which would incur a tax policy the next year. Next slide. Okay, I want to um, I want to stop and talk about the Johnson Amendment for a few minutes because um, I would be willing to proffer a guess that probably not everyone is familiar with the Johnson Amendment. Um, you can see the language that's up there. What's key to know about it is that the Johnson Amendment is really the provision in law that cr in many ways created the nonprofit sector as we know it. And that said that 501c3 organizations and other nonprofits, frankly, um, cannot engage in electoral process electoral politics. So we all know nonprofit organizations can do and should engage in policy work, engage in advocacy work on so many different issues that we care about, but of course have to stay away from electoral politics. You can't endorse a candidate, you can't oppose a candidate, you can't raise money for candidates for office. As you can see, um, this piece of legislation was introduced by then Senator and the Senate Majority Leader at the time, Lyndon Johnson. It was signed by President Eisenhower. It was bipartisan. It's been law more or less unchallenged for 60 years. Um, unfortunately, now in this Congress, we've seen two different pieces of legislation introduced, one that would completely repeal the Johnson Amendment and one that would significantly weaken it. And we've also seen an effort by the administration to weaken it. Um, what that would mean, if it were actually to happen, if it were really to be completely eliminated, it is hard for me to describe what a truly monumental change I think that would um, we, I, I try to stay away from the, uh, from hyperbole, but I, I think it's really important to understand that that would actually completely destroy the nonprofit sector as we know it, because what it would do is it would open the door for unlimited political contributions, right? Because right now there are force limits on how much you can give to a candidate for their campaign. This way you could give money to a 501c3 organization and say to them, go run political ads. So it would be unlimited political contributions, be anonymous political contributions, because that doesn't need to be reported, and it would be tax deductible political contributions. So it would change our whole political system and it would change our nonprofit system. Imagine you are you know, a small, a small town Jewish federation, for example, and you've got an operating budget of say three million dollars. Not that small, I realize, but you know, a million dollars. Somebody comes to you and says, here's $5 million, take $2 million of it for your budget, do whatever you want to do with it. Say you're the CEO and they say, you can do whatever you want. You can pay it to yourself. 
You can put it into your programs. You can do whatever you want and take the other two, three million dollars and run political ads against your local senator. It's going to be very, very difficult to say no to that. Now, you can say, all right, well, that's not their job. They shouldn't do that. But what if that person who brings them that money is their current board chair and the person who currently gives them their biggest gift, right? They're going to be in a really, really difficult spot there. Or what if their current board chair supports the, that existing senator and somebody else comes with that money and says, we want you to oppose that senator? It's going to bring in money and bring in political pressure in a way that, and, and there are a lot more examples and a lot more, frankly, insidious examples than that. You know, are you going to have to, as a nonprofit now, start politically supporting members of Congress who are on key committees that maybe um, control some of the government grant funding that you get or control the programs that you get? So it would really massively, massively um, alter what, what the entire nonprofit sector looks like, including foundations, but certainly not limited to that. So we have uh, helped lead the sector in opposition to this. It says the here, there's the community letter in support of nonpartisanship actually has over 5,500 signers already, um, foundations, nonprofits of all kinds all around the country. And we've met repeatedly um, with all the key committee members and shared information about this with, all, with every member of Congress. Next slide, please. So this is the, the Charity Act. This bill, and you can see the House and Senate versions here, is really key because it brings together a number of provisions. It includes the Donor Advised Fund, fund provision. It includes the Private Foundation Excise Tax Simplification. And it includes language about protecting the full scope and value of the charitable deduction. So this piece of legislation here um, is something that we helped to introduce in order, and you can see the list of some of the supporters. It's longer than that now, um, in order to really help demonstrate support for the issues that we care about on, on Capitol Hill as they move all of these things toward comprehensive tax reform. Next slide, please. Um, let's just go ahead. That's the provisions that I just mentioned. These are the Johnson Amendment bills, again, uh, as discussed. Um, obviously, Shira has all of the slides, and I'm, I'm happy to share uh, the slides and information about any of the legislation that people are interested in. So I'm not going to go into the details of it too much uh, right now. And you know, when it comes to endowments, uh, again, we've got sort of a good news, bad news. The good news is there are no provisions right now and no indications that there will be provisions that will particularly address uh, foundation endowments or change their tax status. Um, the bad news is that there is a very distinct and aggressive effort to target university endowments and to put a number of limitations on. Congressman Tom Reed from New York's 23rd District is leading this effort, and he is really pushing um, to, to put a number of different provisions and limitations on university endowments, which uh, we at the council have not taken a position on. Universities are not part of our constituency, but we are paying a very careful eye because legally, uh, structurally within tax, tax code, university endowments are no different than foundation endowments, and it would be I would say more than a slippery slope. It would be a very, very easy step from putting a bunch of requirements on university endowments and then turning around and saying, well, why don't we have these on foundation endowments as well? That's another spot where we could make where we could make up a lot of revenue. So um, we are carefully engaged in that conversation. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the details about Congressman Reed's legislation there, but I think we can go through that. So um, that covers pretty much the different pieces of legislation that I wanted to highlight. I want to talk about one other quick thing. As you can see here, the, the council is going to be hosting our uh, actual first ever national policy summit. We have been doing an annual conference that I don't know if any of you have ever been to, but you know normally brings 1,500 or so people together. And we've gone to an every other year schedule for that conference. So um, this April, we're going to be hosting our first policy summit in Philadelphia, starting on the evening of April 11th and going through around lunchtime on the 13th. We will be talking about tax policy and tax reform, but we'll also be talking about advocacy, lobbying, looking at budget and appropriations and spending issues, and really looking at civic engagement and what we can and should be doing as foundations, as philanthropies, as nonprofits, what are the, the legal lines and the appropriate ways that we can really exercise that leadership in our community and help people get more engaged, again, in an appropriate 501c3 way, uh, but as we get closer to the 2018 elections. 
Next slide. So that's it. Tax reform, you know, for a long time we've been saying tax reform is coming. Tax reform is now here. Uh, so with that, Shira, I will uh, pass the baton back to you and see if we've got some questions. Thank you so much, Hazar. Um, it seems that we have kind of a quiet crowd. Um, I'm going to give everybody just a couple, a minute maybe, to, to think about everything Hadar went over. Um, I'm also happy to unmute um, folks if they'd like to verbally ask their question as opposed to typing it into the Q&A box. So you can chat that to me. Um, I'll give everybody just a second there. Great. I, either way, it's fine with me. While folks are thinking about it, I'll, I'll take one more minute to talk about where we are right now, sort of in terms of next steps. So the Senate Finance Committee is hosting a hearing um, to, on Thursday on individual tax, tax code and tax reform. They've had one already on the business tax code. We are awaiting sometime soon, and it's been said to be coming in September, a statement for what is called the, the Gang of Six, which is Secretary Mnuchin and Gary Cohn from the White House. Chairman Brady and Speaker Ryan and Chairman Hatch and Leader McConnell are going to put forward some kind of policy framework on tax reform. Um, again, it's been delayed a number of times, but that could be coming anytime soon. And then the next step is for the House Ways and Means Committee to then actually draft legislation and go ahead and um, introduce that bill. Again, given all the things that I shared at the beginning about the other pieces that got on the plate and other things that have to happen first, I don't expect to see that the bill part um, anytime soon. I think it remains to be seen when they're going to get to that gang of six statement. Um, but, you know, if you follow these issues, you, you, know, you know that over the last few weeks, we've seen a really um, big increase in the talk and the chatter and the action around tax reform, the hearings going on, the speeches being given, et cetera. So they are turning up the heat and they're trying to turn to tax reform, they still got a lot of obstacles in the way. Um, but it is going to be more and more um, something that you're seeing, you know, on the front page of the papers, uh, not just something that uh, the tax papers are writing about. Great. Um, we do have one question that came in, Hadar, and it looks like a member is curious how best to stay informed. Um, this person is a foundation professional and um, a lot of what you're talking about would have implications for the foundation that she works at. And so what are the best ways that she can stay on top of these, the news and um, all of the changes that are happening? Sure, thank you. So, uh, like I said, a, there is a lot moving and there is a lot changing right now. Um, the, the easiest answer, I would say, is to come, go to the council's website, it's, uh, cof.org. So all of the sort of static information, all of the pieces of legislation I mentioned, et cetera, can all be found there on the policy tab. Um, but also you can sign up for Snapshot, which is our weekly uh, policy email that goes out every Thursday. And Snapshot is constantly updated with, you know, what's going on, what are the hearings, what legislation has moved, what things are, are happening. And if you sign up on our COF website, if you, you know, if you join the list overall, you also get action alerts from us. So as legislation is introduced um, or as there are moments of action where, where it's important to reach out and, you know, talk to your legislative officials, you'll get those emails from us. Um, so those are, are really simple email, you know, really simple uh, steps to take. To be kept in the loop on all these resources. Um, I do want to share, you know, anybody who is interested in more information about this, uh, I would be happy to talk to directly or if you have other colleagues, staff, etc., who you want to send my way. Um, Shira, I, hopefully you can share my contact information with everybody. I would be, I would be happy to do that. Um, and one piece that, you know, we didn't get into, but as we're talking about what are, what are the next steps, it's really, really important for everybody to know, regardless of what kind of foundation you're affiliated with, whether that's a private family foundation, um, you know, or some, some other form, that 
these issues of, of tax reform as they relate to nonprofit policy, you are 100% legally allowed to engage on these, to advocate, to educate, to lobby, whatever words you want to use. The rules around lobbying for foundations are very clear that private foundations can't lobby on policy issues with the exception of what's called the self-defense clause, which is things that impact your ability to do your business. So things about the charitable deduction or the private foundation excise tax or any of those things, um, you are fully empowered to reach out to your elected officials, to share your opinions with them. And again, if you come to cof.org, you'll find all the resources, you know, prepared, the policy papers, the action alerts, all of those pieces. Anything else, Shira? Great. No, no other questions have come in. I will certainly share your contact information and slides with anybody who reaches out to me. Um, Hadar, thank you so much for your time and your expertise on this matter. Um, just a couple other announcements before we close. We have a lot of programs coming up, um, and I want to mention just a couple. Um, on Thursday, we have a webinar again at 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on disaster response and preparedness in Jewish philanthropy. Um, we're going to discuss how has the Jewish philanthropic field response, responded to Hurricanes Harvey and Irma and previous disasters and how are we preparing for the future. Um, so we'll be joined by um, folks from the Avichai Foundation, JFNA, um, an organization called Nechama, which is Jewish Response to Disaster. And so you should certainly tune in if you are, if you are able. Um, also, I'll just mention next Monday, September 18th, we are having part one of an After Charlottesville series. Um, we're doing a program called Lifting the Rock, What We Need to Know and Do About Charlottesville and Hate in America. Um, we are going to have some experts with deep knowledge and experience of white supremacists and hate groups address the issues, um, what's new in, in what did we learn from this atrocity, what wasn't new, and how bad is the situation now. Um, we'll be joined by Yavila McCoy, who's the CEO of Dimensions, Eric Ward, the incoming executive director of Western State Center, and Sharon Alpert. Um, president of the Nathan Cummings Foundation will moderate for us. Um, and one more I'll mention for now, on October 3rd, we have How is the Trump Presidency Changing American Jewelry? Um, with the upturn in anti-Semitism and the activist revival and all of these things going on in the U.S., um, how, how can funders address the wide spectrum of issues related to the American Jewish community? And we'll be joined by JFN member Dr. Stephen Wynn Mueller for a discussion of American Jewry's ongoing socio-political upheavals during this extraordinary period in U.S. history. So you can feel free to read more about these events and others at jfunders.org. And again, Hadar, thank you so much um, for for leading this presentation, and thank you to everybody who um, who was on the call. Great. Have thank a great you, day. Sarah. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 -bye.